Greetings, fans of the magical entertainment box so fun. I think that's what all the kids are calling the internet these days. I don't know, my kids are only, like, really small, so they don't, they don't call the internet anything. Anyways, today's beer of the week is a salad, according to science. And it is brought to us by Cocapelli Beer Company in Westminster, Colorado. I guess it's not really brought to us so much as it's brought to me, and I'll tell you about it, so maybe you can go to it. But that's not the point. The point is beer. Anyways, this is their new porter they have on tap this week. They have lots of good stuff from day to day. I would highly recommend checking them out if you haven't. I'll link what kind of beer this is. I forget what it's called but I'll link it in the description or put it on untapped or something so you can follow me there. Anyways, welcome to Zero Dollar Productions new show title pending. I won't make a joke about the title because I did that last week and every week before that. Well, maybe that counts as a joke, just pointing that out. Anyways, today's list is the top five dragons in gaming. So we're going to start with... Onyxia, bum bum bum, evil bad dragon, yeah. Anyways, Onyxia is a really cool kind of a dragon boss. Dragons are cool bosses, just in general. I feel like if a dragon isn't a boss, it's just, like, there's, there's something about a dragon being a boss that just makes it better. And it's like in Skyrim, there's dragons just everywhere, and so when you do finally get to a dragon that's a boss, kind of sucks because it's the same thing. But this was even a further extent of having a dragon as a boss than I think anything has really come close to. Because this was a boss that required 40 guys to deal with. And there was a lot of those in old World of Warcraft, whether they were dragons or whatever. There was several 40-man raids that you had to have 40 guys to really do. And I kind of miss that because, I don't know, it was... It was, there was just something special about getting together with that many people to try and take down this thing. And Onyxia was my favorite 40-man raid from the old World of Warcraft just because it was so simple. You know, you go in and you fight this giant dragon. And even though it was that simple, it still had, you know, its crazy mechanics that you had to watch out for. Because the dragon would fly around and shoot fireballs and then it would land on the ground and then you could hit it. And then it would have all these thousands and thousands of little whelps that would try and kill you. So it had a lot going on for it, even though it, on the outside, would appear to be just a basic dragon fight. Moving on to number four. This dragon in gaming is something that everybody remembers from their childhood, or at least everybody's from the 90s. And if your childhood wasn't in the 90s, I'm so sorry for you. You should have been born later. Or earlier. Depending on... Anyway, you should have been born in the 90s. Point of the story is, number four is the Blue Eyes White Dragon. Bow, bow, bow. I feel like this should have like the most epic theme music like it did in the show for no reason. It's like, I play the Blue Eyes White Dragon. That's kind of where the hype for this thing comes from, is the show. Like, by itself, it's an okay card. If you know the game, this is okay. Um... Uh, like, now they're printing things that just, like, that's that's terrible. But at the time, it was an okay card to run. And even though it was just okay, it seemed like it was, like, the game-winning card. It's like, you pull this, and you're gonna win horribly. And, like, everybody that I remember growing up with was just, like, crazy into this game and trying to get one of these cards specifically like all the other cards were cool but if you had the blue eyes white dragon you were like the king of the playground at recess because i was those weird kids that didn't actually play on the playground we sat at the little table and played card games but anyways it 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 was really almost kind of a special moment as a child to get your blue eyes white dragon i remember i had a buddy who traded like his thousand dragon card which if you remember from way back in the day was a pretty expensive pretty rare difficult to find card he had the the one that she got out of a booster pack and that's like 
one of the most impossible to find cards at the time, and he traded that for a Blue Eyes White Dragon out of the starter deck that you could just get for 10 bucks at, you know, wherever the starter decks were sold, like Walgreens and stuff, I think they even sold them at at the time. And there's a lot of us that were like, oh my god, that was such a good trade. But now, like, looking back on it, it's like, wow, that was stupid. That This thing isn't nearly as good as it's hyped to be, and that thing could have sold for, like, like, I think it was upwards of 40, 50 bucks at the time. <laughs> like, I don't know what it is now. I don't track it. But it was just kind of a funny thing that how cool it was because of the show really affected the mindset of the people playing the game, at least the children playing the game, which is who should play children's card games, I think. Anyways, we're going to move on to number three. The number three best dragon in gaming is... Executor! Didn't see that coming, did you? I love this new Executor. It hasn't actually come out yet. This is the new form of Executor exclusive to the Alola region in Pokemon Sun and Moon. It's been shown off in, like, one trailer, and I am super excited for it. Uh, the original Executor was a Grass and Psychic type, which is a pretty decent typing. This one's a Grass and Dragon type, which is where I can put it into my Dragons list. I think this thing is just hilarious. It's such a weird looking thing, and I think the weird looking Pokemon are part of what's keeping Pokemon alive. It's not so much that they're the only thing about it that I like or that people like, but I think the diversity of kinds of Pokemon is part of what keeps that series going. Because you have your ridiculously epic, awesome, legendary Pokemon, and you have your cute little things like your little Pikachu and Jigglypuff have been popular since the first generation. And then you get these weird things like Slowbro and Exeggutor and all kind of things like that that are just kind of weird, silly Pokemon. And without them, I don't know that it would have quite the same effect. Like, you look at a game like Monster Hunter, where everything is this ridiculously awesome epic monster, and that's not half as popular as Pokemon. That's not to say it's not a good series, but with this combination of different kinds of monsters, I think that's something that is really good going for Pokemon in general. Also, the new type being Grass Dragon, I said that already, but that's just a really good type. Like, it's going to take a lot of damage from Ice-type moves, if you know anything about type advantage in the game, which, if you don't, then I'm not totally sure why you're watching a gaming video, uh, unless you're, like, the one gamer in the world who doesn't play Pokemon. I'm sure most of us are at least playing Pokemon Go now that it came out. But anyways, I digress. And I digest. I digest beer. Bad jokes aside, that's a good type. Grass and Dragon, you're going to get Stab on a lot of cool moves. I'm sure his move set is going to be really cool. I think he's going to be a really big physical attacker, which is going to be a kind of a weird change from the original one. Um, and maybe have some pretty good defenses. Also, he's the tallest Pokemon ever. And you just got to say something about that because it's funny that he is 35 feet tall and a palm tree dragon. I think that's hilarious. So, we're going to move on to number two. The number two greatest dragon in gaming is Gliok, which for some reason the image didn't really blow up. A lot of these didn't. The Exeggutor one did, actually, is the only one that did. Um, and that's not the point. Anyways, Gliok is a really cool boss from the original Legend of Zelda. Made a couple of little appearances here and there through the series, but never again as uh, exactly the same form as he was. In the original Zelda, uh, you see he's got these four heads there. Um, I think in earlier stages you found him with two heads and then three heads and then four heads was like in the last stage or two stages. I forget exactly which one he appeared in, but he's got these four heads and he's like this big hydra thing and hydras are a cool kind of dragon anything's got like a lot of heads 
like like if Blue Eyes White Dragon had like three heads or something, everybody would like flip their you know what for that. That'd be oh wait. Anyway, um lost my train of thought, so I have to drink, which means you have to drink a couple of times. I hope you've been keeping up, because this is the first time I've actually counted. Ah, that's good beer. Mm. But anyways, hydras have been used before and since, but never quite like Gliok. Gliok was a very unique take on the Hydra, because it's got these two, three, or four heads, and then if you stab it enough in the game, basically it takes that effect and it cuts off one of its heads. Cool, all right, you're doing good. Except when you cut off a Gleox head, it starts flying around the room. Like the head sprouts wings and starts flying around the room and shoots fireballs at you and makes the fight even more intense. That's just ridiculous. That's one of my favorite examples of old school gaming bosses just not being fair. And because of that, he was the hardest boss in the game, except for Ganon. And that's just, that's kind of impressive, if you can be harder than a lot of those bosses from the original Zelda games. Anyway, it's going to move on to number one. Number one dragon in gaming is the Zombie Dragon. Now, some of you are probably going like, what? Zombie Dragon? What's that even from? This is... One of the most unique dragons, I think, in gaming. It's from Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles, the original one. Not any of the DS ones or the one on Wii that didn't make any sense and had no multiplayer. But the original one for GameCube, which was a great game because you get, you know, four players playing together on their Game Boys plugged into the GameCube. That was awesome. But anyways, he's in this swamp area that ends up having been cursed by him, basically. Uh, it's a lot of kind of interesting story behind that and why he's got all this poisonous swamp and, you know, what's going on there and what happened there beforehand because it turns out that this swamp used to be a village that was overtaken, basically. It's... A really cool story. You should definitely go check that out. I don't want to spoil anything. I wouldn't spoil anything from that game anyway. One of the best things about that game is there was a lot of little stories. Every level in this game had its own little story that you kind of got a glimpse of at the start and you kind of figured out what it was about by the end of it when you actually fought the boss. And the boss had some tie into the story. And that was just really great storytelling, really great game design, and really great world design on the part of the designers. Um, it also had a great implementation of multiplayer. Um, the whole game kind of did. Because uh, in the multiplayer, the only way to cast some of the bigger spells was actually you had to both cast one spell or another at the same time, and based on whichever spell you cast together, they could combine spells into different spells. And that was probably the easiest way, obviously, to beat this boss. Uh, I would almost argue the only way, but I've seen that it is possible to do it without doing this, because if you can't cast the holy spell, then none of your physical attacks do almost any damage, and none of your other magical attacks do almost any damage but if you cast the holy spell on it it appears it's kind of like this ghost in the first place and then you get it to appear by casting the holy on it which does a lot of damage and then opens it up to other attacks which if you can't time that right and actually kind of work together it's a really really tough boss to beat um in the end though after you do beat it it also gives you pretty much the best treasure in the game you get um if you beat it with so many points, I won't go into the whole thing, but you get the possibility of getting a magical ring that will let you cast Cure at any time, and a magical ring that will let you cast the Life Spell and resurrect people at any time, based on how well you did in the fight. And those rings can't be found anywhere else, and they're 
in my opinion, they're the strongest magical items in the game, and they're totally worth getting, even though, like, just to get a chance is, like, you have to do really well and beat this boss. But it's totally worth it in the end. And I don't care how many times I have to go back to that stage. I love going through that stage because it's got the little story with the dragon and what's going on, and it's got a lot of cool enemies to fight along the way. And there's lots of other cool treasure you can get through that. And anyways, that is my top five dragons list. I'm going to finish this beer. I recommend you finish your beer as well if you're drinking along at home. Which sounds like it should be a recurring thing. Drink along at home. It's good for you. Or, uh... No, actually, they had to take that off of Guinness labels. So I guess I'll probably take it off of my show. But anyways, it's tasty. Anyways, this has been a zero-dollar production. Um, I don't know, some kind of ending witty joke. <laughs>